upay nga adlaw maayong adlaw sa mga kaigsuunan nga namuyo sa habakatang bahin sa atong minahal nga Pilipinas We have been planning this gathering since a year ago but the universe had other plans and we bow to the inevitable. I am sorry for not being able to come in person for this gathering. Still, I'm very glad of this chance to dream with you again as I did when I visited Naga for the first time some 20, 20 years ago. Sometimes when we breathe a dream into the air, for the mountains, the sea, and the air can, can hear us, the universe conspires to make it come true. All I have ever done in my life is teach people how to dream and how to share their dreams with others. Today, let us make a sequel to that first dream we dreamed together 20 years ago. Our founding fathers believed that unity is necessary to grow a nation. What threatened our unity was our many different languages that supposedly prevent us from understanding one another. Thus, in 1937, we adopted Tagalog as our national language and English as our official language. We thought, we believed that these two languages will unify us. We had revised our constitution at least four times, but the national language policy remains a cornerstone of our constitution. The Philippine General Education curriculum that I taught during my active years was heavy on Anglo-American literature, sprinkled with a bit of Afro-Asian literature, some Philippine literature in English, and Panitikan for the course in Filipino. English was the medium of instruction at all levels. That was during my time. Now I confess that Teaching literature in English and from English was very, very difficult. My students live their daily lives in their own mother tongues. They derive their meanings from the context of their own, our own culture. Teaching the literatures of a foreign country in a language English in a language that they barely understood was a handicap. It was a handicap that came up every day in the classroom. Teaching literature was a daily challenge. It was also a daily exercise of frustration and endurance for me and for my students. They put up with me, I put up with them. It was almost always a joyless situation. Students hated literature. I do not know if they do so until now, but in my time they really hated literature. And you know, you have to spend a lot of have to use up all kinds of tricks to make them listen to you. Why was that? 
because we were teaching them literature that was irrelevant to their lives. Once after reading a Nick Joaquin story and uh, enjoying for the first time or for the rare times, enjoying his elegant prose in English, the story was Mayday Eve. I asked my class, this was in UP Tacloban, I asked them, is elegant language such as this, you know, in Nick Joaquin, is this possible also in Warai language? Can we write elegant language like this in Warai? And of course they said, no, it's not possible. So in our beloved country, the language of prestige, elegance, and refinement is a foreign language. Whereas our mother tongue, our mother tongues, are reduced to crude and humble uses. Pamaligya o kupras, pamaligya o isda, pangumpra o utanon, maura. No? It is without power. The languages are without power, without pride, without honor. And respect. Note, however, that the lowly language or the lowly state of a language carries over to their speakers in our country. If you notice, language is identity. It is not the land that claims us or defines our identities and affinities. It is the language that we speak. So language to us is very, very important. Some 180 auxiliary languages or subsidiary languages exist all over our country. Literary forms and traditions exist in each of these languages. Resil Mujares refers to these literary forms as the literatures of the margins, regional literature or sub-literatures. These literatures are still part of community life, but they are undervalued. They are undervalued even by the speakers themselves. Mujeres characterizes regional literatures as he calls them, he describes them as literary traditions written or oral of the various ethno-linguistic groups in the country. Despite interior immigrations, interior migrations rather, these communities still have distinct geographical settings or identities. The concept of regional literature is opposed to that of the literatures of court and capital. And of course, the literatures of court and capital in our country are the ruling literatures in English, Spanish, and Tagalog. The first time I came to Naga City 20 years ago, the geographic south seemed to leap into my consciousness and became very, very real. More than territorial, I figured the south more as an idea, a state of being. If place is an influence on the nature of one's world, the nature of one's worldview, then my worldview is shaped by the South, along with the other writers who share my world. It is extremely difficult to create literature 
but it is thrice difficult to create literature if you write from the South. And these are among the reasons. One, we write in subsidiary languages which are outside the priorities of the national language policy. The priority languages are English and Filipino. Resources are centrally located, are centrally controlled, and we are far from the circle of grace. Funds are generally inadequate. So much competition for so little uh, resources. Local governments are generally indifferent to creative and cultural endeavors. And those of us who are working in the South, we're scattered. We're scattered all over the various islands. So most, more often than not, we lack supportive community for our work. In contrast, in Manila, they are sort of concentrated there. All of them are there. And it's easy for them to get together and to talk and to exchange ideas. We in the South, we're scattered all over this huge territory. It's very difficult for us to come together. These are the conditions that, these are the conditions that compelled me or compelled us to imagine what we call a southern literary corridor. We imagine a chain of maybe individuals, institutions, communities, united by a conscious desire to create and promote the Philippine literatures in the languages of the southern regions. So we don't know, we, in, in our concept, we cannot think of it in terms of people, in terms of organizations, maybe in terms of communities, just a consciousness that we need to create and promote the literatures of the languages in the southern regions. What is the southern literary corridor? Is it an organization? Yes, but not necessarily. Is it a movement? Maybe. Is it a consciousness? Which of these elements come first? And so I, th I, I think maybe the consciousness comes first. I, I, I call it a southern consciousness. Probably an individual, an individual awareness of being part of place and people, identifying with them, being part of what makes them special and different, the knowledge, experiences, histories, memories, aspirations that are part of who they are and what they do and what they share. Southern consciousness may stem from the environment around us, a way of life, a way of life that's close to the land, maybe the constant presence of the sea, and the intimate and supportive communities around us. And part of this consciousness is being aware that you are far from the center, which is the source of power and authority. And in our language, that would be Manila. Because we are a very centralized system. So part of this consciousness is being aware that you are far, far from the center, which is the source of power and authority and resources and recognition
These are the handicaps stemming from the condition and creating the state of invisibility and marginality. But, again, part of that southern consciousness that I imagine is also revolutionary. You know that you are far from the center. You know that you are not very well supported. You know that you are alone. You know that you represent a people and languages which are not considered important or vital but being aware of that you are also you also think that all of this must stop so part of that consciousness is also revolutionary refusing to accept subsidiarity claiming responsibility for growth and striving to gain an equal space for one's work in the whole, in the greater whole. If more people share this consciousness, we can create this presumptive southern literary corridor that we are dreaming about. People sharing a similar consciousness and willing to work for the cause. We even mapped this idea it will start maybe from the Bicol Peninsula spread out to Eastern Visayas the islands of Roblon, Maspati and Mindoro Central Visayas Western Visayas all the way to Palawan down to Mindanao all the way to the Sulu Islands and Tawi-Tawi because this is or these are the regions that suffer from the condition of being away from the center, being unsupported, having communities that are separated from one another. And speaking languages that are not priority to the national language policy. Now, this is an area of rich and diverse cultures and multiple languages. It covers more than half of the country. To win this ground is to create the rich tapestry of the national literature, where it has been said that there can be no Philippine national literature until all the languages and its literary materials are accounted for. Now, if this project sounds too huge, too expansive, too complex, impossible to convert into reality, and more than slightly mad, well, it's because it's what it is. It's just a dream, a magnificent dream. The young poet and filmmaker Christian Sendon Cordero was one of those who tapped into that conversation 20 years ago. He didn't say much then, but five years later, I met him in Cebu City during an NCCA conference. He told me, give me any manuscript you have. We are starting the Southern Literary Corridor. The Ateneo de Naga University Press is going to open. I have given two titles to the Ad New Press and proud to say that one of them won the National Book Award for Poetry in 2018 for the Ad New Press. Writers from the Visayas and Mindanao are more than happy now to publish with Ad New. Even those in Manila who have roots in the South are coming back, claiming their Southern connections. I believe that the Southern Literary Corridor is already happening. 
a few more thoughts to ponder. First, our mother tongues have outlasted empires. They are that strong and durable. They are also that well loved by the people. It is standing up today against the restless mobility of the populations. It's standing up against mass media, the internet, and the most, the hardest of all, it's standing up to the national language policy. Despite all this, the mother tongues persist through as ever to our people's needs. Today, many young writers, university educated, are writing again in our mother tongue. They will reclaim our languages from the neglect of past generations. One more thought. We are a fundamentally heterogeneous population. No law can demolish our differences. How to live in peace with one another? By recognizing and respecting that heterogeneity. Recognizing and respecting the differences. The less we know about one another, the easier it is for us to act with impunity against one another. We need literature to bridge our distances and recognize our common humanity. The Higaunon poet and novelist Telesforo Sumkit saw his people's oppression and protested against it. Sungkit was rooted in his culture, but he was well integrated into the mainstream. He spoke four languages, his native Binukid, Cebuano, Filipino, and English. He wrote in all of these languages. He proved to us that we can learn one another's language. In one poem, Sungkit addresses big business. Miners, loggers, speculators, tormentors of his people who want to drive them out of their ancestral land. And they are supported by a government greedy for dollars. He chose to write this piece in English, claiming power over the language. And this is the poem. This is an excerpt from his poem. You laugh, I kneel on big rock, or I pray before a big tree. You laugh. I speak wrong your tongue, or I, not knowing, you say. You angry, I call me Gbaya, you say. My God is devil. You angry, I speak my tongue, you say. Silent, I not speak your tongue. I not laugh. You kneel on dead tree, or you pray to hanging God out there? I'm not angry. You call your God, and I not call him devil. I not laugh. You speak in your teeth, or you calamora speak my tongue. I not say, you silent, you not speak my tongue. I angry, you get my lands. I angry, you get my golds. I angry, you dishonor my sister. But you say, 
I should love brother. Skin also brown. You say, love brother. Skin also brown. But, you help kill grandpa Bailan. You help kill grandma Bae. You help kill Uncle Bagani. You help kill dog. Talamuod. You help kill even my balangkawitan rooster. I angry. You help kill my datus. I angry. You help burn my house. I angry you steal my honey. I angry you pay cheap. My abaca, coffee, coconut, banana, etc. It's bad English, but it's good poem. It's bad English, but it's good poetry. Place, language, and history fuse in this speech, spoken in English by a Tagabukid. Even a foreign language can become our own if we choose to be so. If we choose it to be so. These different voices come to us through literature. We need literature to know our people in all their variety and diversity, their joys and calamities. We need literature to realize our kinship with one another. We need literature to hear and listen to one another and understand what we need. We need equality, justice, and the sense of a shared destiny. We need a southern literary corridor to consolidate the power of our collective voices calling for love and calling for justice after long years of silence and invisibility. Padayon kita sa way pagtalaw o way pagkutas. Tagang salamat. Diyos mabalos.